quiet on set. I'm ready to go. Quiet on set. <laughs> I know. I, I just turned off the few machines that make noise in this office. And I was like, it's quiet. It's quiet on set. Quiet, everyone. Time to record. I just have never, ever even heard you say anything close to that before. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna, lights, camera, action. <laughs> We're rolling. Yeah. Rolling on sound. That's it. That's it. We're rolling. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? Good. I have some follow up for you. Oh, yeah. The follow up about your sleep. People were very uh, interested uh, in your sleep. <laughs> <sighs> Said it many times before. You never really know what people are going to latch on to. Mm-hmm. But oh boy, the people, in, especially on Reddit, latch on to my sleep patterns. Everyone was very concerned, Mike. Everyone mm. was very concerned for you. I'm just happy we have so many medical professionals in our audience. <laughs> Who knew? I want to just follow up on something. I mean, you can people can take from this what they wish. Surprise, surprise, there was a bug with the data. Oh, okay. Very surprising. I appear to not have had 240 alarms in a week because when I checked it a couple of days ago, that exact same week, the 8th to the 15th of March, it said 84, which is a significant difference to 240 or whatever the number was. Mm -hmm. So basically, all I want to say is, yeah, I do have a lot of alarms every day. It's nowhere near the amount, it seems, that was originally reported. Still seems like a lot. (laughs) It is a lot. It is a lot. But I've been thinking about it. Like, Mm. I overset alarms. I don't need as many alarms on as I have. Because what tends to happen for me, Gray, because if you have, like, a bunch of alarms set, like me, I have one 10-minute intervals. That's like the snooze interval. So what usually happens is I get, like, four alarms at once and just dismiss them all. Because you've snoozed them, and so they're overlapping? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, okay. Why don't you just snooze the one alarm? Right, but because now, this is what I'm saying, I've got two things going on here. I'm sure this this isn't going to make my case any better, but here we are. I'm in it now. I'm in it now. <laughs> I, I can feel ev- everyone hands hovering above the keyboard. <laughs> I set a lot of alarms, and I snooze them all, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, well, I could just set one alarm and just snooze it a bunch of times, but my... Neuroses mm-hmm. won't allow for that because what if I turn off the alarm rather than snooze it and now I've slept through the whole day? That is fair. It, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to accidentally hit the uh, stop alarm versus snooze alarm. So I think that that's a reasonable concern. Look, I give myself an hour, right? That okay. is the agreement I have made with myself, right? I have one hour from the first mm-hmm. alarm until I wake up. I can get up any time within that hour, and I do. Uh Sometimes it's only two or three alarms and I'm up. Oh, very impressive. Sometimes it's 10. Mm, Less impressive. Mm -hmm. Give myself the best part of an hour, and uh, my alarms will just keep going off until then. That's just where I am. (sighs) (laughs) I do have some good, I think, objectively good follow-up, though. Okay. I set a 30-minute daily time limit on Twitter. Oh, very good. I just thought to myself, why don't I do this? You know, like Mm -hmm. you want to spend less time on it. I've just spent two hours talking about a system that is supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing. And obviously I've been keeping to it. There's been a day or two where I gave myself a little bit of extra time. Mm -hmm. But now like I'm down to like two and a bit hours a week down from like four hours. So you're getting the uh, the screen comes down when your time is up and it yep. says no more Twitter for you. And then it's like you can ignore it for the day. Get, I like one more minute. That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. It's just funny to me that that's like, just hey, just oh, one more minute. Come on, one more minute, please. The one more minute does make me smile because it always makes me feel like a child when I press it, right? That I'm, I'm asking yep. for, for my parents for that's one more minute. That's who it's for. <laughs> yeah. And... I know this isn't the case, but it it feels a little bit like it's a hangover from the days when we used to have to save files or something. Like, no, you don't understand. I just I just need one more minute to press a couple buttons, wrap something up. There is something you know, useful go. in that though, because usually when I hit that, I was doing something, mm-hmm. right? And I just want to finish the thing that I was doing. Because mm-hmm. I've been like composing a tweet, like you know, publish a show, putting a tweet out, and then like the thing pops up, and I'm like. I just need one more minute. I, have, I was right. like halfway through something here. <laughs> but what I do appreciate about Apple's system is it, like, it tracks me everywhere, right? Even on the web. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I think it's smart that they do oh, that. Oh, right. I forget. I forget that they did do that, that they have their different way of mm-hmm. recognizing that this is all the same service as Twitter. That That is a good feature. For all of the complaining that we've done, that is a good feature. And it's just been really interesting to me to like just take kind of mental stock of what time of the day I'm hitting the 30 minutes. It's like some days it's not even lunchtime. Mm. Some days I don't see it at all. 
I'm just, I've still got a lot to learn about myself from this. I've only been doing it for like a week and a half, but I actually think it might be the right move for me. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's great. I'm glad to hear that you're doing that and that, that it's working for you. Like, th- again, this is, this is the promise of the system is to try to bring in alignment what sitting down rational you wants you to do and then what in the moment you wants to do, which mm-hmm. getting those things into alignment it's, it's not always it's not always as as easy as we wish it would be. No. So I'm basically making my computer shame me, which I'm fine with. Yeah. It's in the privacy of your own home. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're punchy today. You're sleepy. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is this is gray on five hours of of sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are recording this the day after you published a video. So it, it, t- it turns out that drinking coffee at 10 p.m to do a director's commentary it's not a great recipe for a good night's <laughs> a good night's sleep so that yeah, decision uh... that like late night coffee decision is just killer you know I, I, it happens to me a few times a year as well right where it's mm-hmm. like all right i've got a thing and i just got to do it i have yep. no other way around this and i know the only way i'm going to get through it is i need that little extra yeah. and if i but if i do this <laughs> everything <laughs> afterwards is worse and it's like well this is, i'm sorry but this is this is how i'm going so yeah it's like this this is what the drugs are for sometimes right i was like well i'm going to inject myself with this and keep going and pay for it later and now is later great i have some good news for you today mm-hmm. i had asked our audience for some ask cortex questions because I, I like to touch on these every now and then and I know that for you, these episodes are easier on you, which is good. So, <laughs> oh, thank you, Mike. Gonna hold my hand, and we're gonna we're gonna take you through the show today. Oh, you're leading me through the garden of Ask Cortex. Mm-hmm. That's that's delightful. It's also it's been a while since it we've been, been in the while. Ask Cortex garden. So I'm very happy to be here on a sleepy Saturday afternoon. Although to be honest, the first question is kind of a big one. I apologize. Vlad asks, "What do you think the state of the workplace will be after the pandemic?" Oh, that's that's. I mean, that's not a big question at all. <laughs> But I mean it, though. Okay. It'll be the same. That's the answer. I think everyone's dramatically overestimating this. Uh-uh. I disagree with you. Okay, why? Convince me. Corporations have now realized how much money they could save. I'm not sold. I'm not sold on this argument. But go on. Tell me more. This is a little bit informed by some conversations I've been having with people that work in large businesses. Oh, intriguing. That there are lots of companies who have let some of their workspace go. Mm -hmm. And there are also companies that are realizing that now some of their employees have had that sweet taste of working from home life and won't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. So I do think that for a lot of companies, not all, but for a lot of companies, the workplace is going to be different. There is going to be more remote working. There is going to be less office space in general. There will be lots of businesses that will return just as normal, right? No Mm -hmm. doubt about it. But I believe that there will be lots of businesses that will reduce the amount of people that they have coming in. So we'll have to change the way that the workplace is set up to have more collaborative space, more meeting spaces and stuff like that for the people that are just dropping in for the day. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of that. So like there's some companies that I know in the UK, large companies, media companies that are looking at this as their approach now. Hmm. The saving money thing, man, it's a real deal. And also, as well, I will say, yeah. a lot of technology companies, like American technology companies, they said that like we now have a completely do-what-you-want remote working policy forever, mm-hmm. which just wasn't a thing that existed before for a lot of these organizations. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the saving money thing, that obviously, that's that's a good argument. I just... I'm not convinced it'll hold over the long run. And like my suspicion is this is also just partly about the way humans are. And I think that as the pandemic recedes into distant memory, you're you're going to have the same phenomenon where managers want their direct reports in a building around them. Butts on seats. Yeah, butts on seats. Mm -hmm. And I think the internal company politics of that, you know, look at this tiny kingdom I oversee and the people who report to me and I'm so busy interrupting them all day from getting their work done as a manager. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just think that's a, that's a strong, irrational pull that I just expect will return and, and will come back. It's, it's a little bit like I've been talking to some people who are convinced about, oh, there's going to be so many people who are living out in the country and cities are going to experience depopulation. And it's like, 
I don't know. There's there's a reason that people go to cities. People don't just live in cities because there's job opportunities in cities. Like there's there's many reasons. It's not an accident. And like the gravitational pull of of cities is like yeah sure it's been loosened, but I'm pretty sure that if we draw a graph of city populations going ten years back and ten years in the future, it'll be hard to even see the pandemic on that graph. You know for for having any kind of impact. So. I don't know. I hope that you are right. I think that home working for people who can swing it is a much better situation. Well, okay. <laughs> what's, what's what's that well? So there's another part of this, which... So I have painted the rosy picture for many people, but you brought up company politics. So there is going to mm. have to be a lot of change in the way that companies operate. And I think I could see there being an initial change and then a like a bounce back from it a little bit. Because if some people are in the office all the time, some people aren't, what is the relationship change for those people? Like, if there are six people in a team and five of them are in the office and then there's one person that works remote, does anybody remember the remote person? Do they end up feeling left out? And then also, what if certain managers, you know, they just promote the people they see all the time? Mm -hmm. Like, so companies that aren't used to this or companies that don't fully embrace it, but just have it as a thing you can do, if they have to go through the, the, the culture change, honestly, because that otherwise... That's not, that's not going to culture change it for is the companies. A culture change. It is <laughs> no, a no, culture change. I'm saying that things are different, but, but what will not happen is that there's going to be some kind of culture change and that's where the we're... Yeah, where, oh, we're, we, we here, our culture here is to go completely against the human grain of who you're talking to and scheming about, you know, at the water cooler. We're going to treat the people who are remote in their cabins in Montana as equal players in this game of monkey politics of getting, you know, one up on the other person. It's like, there's no way that's, that's going to go away. So, so this, is, this is partly what I mean, like the gravitational pull of an office is just too strong. If you're going to work remote, I think... You just have to accept that part of the deal in that is you are not going to be promoted as frequently. You are not going to be thought about as much. And that's why I say for people who can swing it, like for some people, that's great. You know, like that's a plus, not a minus. But for many people, like they don't want to have a job where they are forgotten and never promoted. So this is why I, I think you're making a case for why people will end up back in the office over the long run, e even if it like saves a company money. Oh, I see. The, the point that I'm making is that I think there are two things that will happen. Mm -hmm. I think there will be a change and then there will be another one. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the, the place that will end up at, there will be more people that work remotely than they did prior to the pandemic, but it is not going to be at the numbers that a lot of people think, which is, hey, this worked fine. Yeah, this worked fine because you were all remote. Mm -hmm. So unless your workplace goes all remote, it's not going to be like this. Yeah. When people start going back to the office, you're going to see a different result to how it's been for the last year. Yeah. I, I think for companies, it's like all remote or nothing is like the two optimal solutions. I'm, tr I'm trying to remember, uh, what is it? I think it's WordPress, like th that they're an entirely remote company with a huge number of people. And it's like, yeah, you can make it work if everyone is remote. And then that does mitigate the in-person politics stuff. Mm -hmm. But half remote half there there's always going to be an advantage inside the company for the people who are physically present so we'll see but i don't expect much change in-person meetings handshakes they're all coming back baby they're all coming back they're gonna come back with a vengeance too <laughs> handshakes will last a full 25 seconds yeah people are going to be so happy to do handshakes they're going to do that aggressive two-handed handshake <laughs> right we're gonna you, put the go, whole yes. upper body into it yeah i've completely in enclosed your hand in my hand for this shaking for uh, this, the for handshake this rubbing hug. it's gonna be handshake to make hug. sure all all of the surface contact that's possible all of the germ transfer that could happen it's gonna happen this episode of Cortex is brought to you by Microsoft Lists, your smart information tracking app in Microsoft 365. Keeping track of information is something that is in everybody's job description. Quite simply, writing things down is what works for simple lists, but it can get overwhelming when you need to stay on top of hundreds of items and get others to pay attention and act on them. 
Microsoft Lists is a Microsoft 365 app that helps you easily track information and organize your work. Lists are simple, smart, and flexible, so you can stay on top of what matters most to your team. Track issues, assets, routines, contacts, inventory, and more using customizable views and smart rules and alerts to keep everyone in sync. With ready-made templates, you can quickly start lists online on the new mobile app for iOS and directly within Microsoft Teams. And because it's part of Microsoft 365, you can rely on enterprise-ready security and compliance. I was trying out Microsoft Lists myself, and it is so easy to create a list, and they have these really great templates. Like, you could create a content plan for your blog or an inventory of the tech at your office. Everything is laid out really simply, super easy to understand, and fast. If you're setting up a new list from scratch, they have great tools to help you create the entries. Like, you can choose from entering text to images, maybe yes or no questions, multiple choice, tons of great data input options that will be awesome for when you're putting in stuff later on. And they also have automation built in so for example if an item is marked as complete it could fire off an email to someone super useful when working in a large team your list just got a whole lot smarter get more done with microsoft lists go to aka.ms slash ms lists for more information videos demos blogs and more that is aka.ms slash ms lists Make a list and let it flow. Our thanks to Microsoft Lists for their support of this show and Relay FM. Betty asks, For busy people who get hundreds of actionable emails a day, how do you stay on top of it when your full-time job is not dealing with your email? Mike, would you like to, would you like to answer this question? So I wondered if you... I mean, there was, there was a time in your life where you did have to deal with the email that you got. Like, maybe before you were a YouTuber. When you were a teacher, <laughs> yeah, did you yeah. get a lot of emails as a teacher? Yeah, no, I got hundreds of emails as, mm-hmm. a, as a teacher. I mean, but this is why my answer is probably not helpful because my my answer would be along the lines of, yeah, when I was a teacher, the name of the game was try to figure out what's really actionable, as in which of these things will cause me problems and everything else that is actionable now becomes actionable with a bunch of air quotes around it, you know, and and for me, the real answer there is like brutal triage of I only care about the things that are going to cause me problems. But I don't think that's generally good advice. You know, I was in a very particular situation at the time. So that's why I think whatever you have to say is going to be much more valuable than what I have to say on this topic. I don't think it is, Gray, because I have the same advice. Here's the thing. Not all actionable email actually requires action. Okay. In my corporate job, I got more email than I get now. Mm. Everything was done by email and everybody thought they needed the answer. Right. Mm-hmm. This is this is part of the problem. Actionable email. A lot of it is just people think they need it to be actioned by you mm-hmm. more than you need to action that email. Mm-hmm. So what I would say is for anybody who is finding this happen to them and it's new, you have to do a bit of training on yourself over time of trying to work out what is the stuff that truly requires your attention and learning over time the things that you're able to just ignore and see if they come back. Mm -hmm. Like that's the real thing that everyone, I think, ultimately learns who's in this position. Like what are the actual real requirements or what are the real things that need my attention? And what are the things that will just naturally go away if I ignore them? This is not, quote, actionable advice, (laughs) but it's just a thing that, that is the only way to deal with this. I will tell you, it always feels like there is more on the line than there is a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And I have found, like Gray has found, that you can kind of let some stuff go and it will just disappear. The person forgot about it. Right. Yeah. Or, again, I think my bad dial is turned up slightly here where it's not, not even things that would go away, but stuff was like, oh, I can take the negative consequences of that. Like, that's, fu- that's fine. A, b- a bad thing yeah, will that's happen. Just, that's part of the yeah. risk factor of, <laughs> of trying to decide what needs to go away. Is you, someone might say to you, like, this is unacceptable, why have you not replied? And then you need to reply, right? Like, what are you going to do? Right. Then you stumble around. Oh, I was so busy. I was so, so sorry, I missed it. Oh, I never got your email. <laughs> we have your read receipt right here. Oh, uh... Cat fell on the keyboard, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's, it's, it, this is a really tricky one, but it is ultimately something you need to remember that for most people, your job isn't answering email. Your job is doing your job mm. and you've got to try and find that balance for yourself. One of the ways that actually really helped me get out of this was I, for a while, decided I was only going to check email for half an hour twice a day. Mm -hmm. And if you're setting that kind of hard limit on yourself and you get lots and lots of email, you'd be surprised how quickly you start to realize what you need to respond to. Mm. if you limit the amount of time that you actually have to spend on it because it's going to keep building up. Then you start to build your own filter of what can just be removed, what could be filed away for later, that kind of stuff. Mm. It's tricky. Yeah, no, it, it's totally tricky. This also just kind of goes back to the previous question a little bit and our recurring fascination with big companies and the what is everybody doing here kind of question. And I just remember thinking that a lot when I got a whole bunch of teacher emails is it's like oh you log in and there's 200 messages all of which are supposedly you know requesting something from you and just just having that experience of what are all of these people who send these emails doing like i like i'm not replying to them i suspect a lot of other people are also playing the same game that i'm playing like there's a lot of like turbulent flow in bigger organizations i think where the water is fighting itself as it's flowing through the pipe and there's a lot of unnecessary motion and you just want to stay away from that like you answer a bunch of emails and you just train other people that you are part of this world of people who are sending emails back and forth all day long and that can quickly spiral up into a lot of busyness that accomplishes just absolutely nothing in terms of the real hard valuable things that need to get done any day now slack's gonna save us from email any day <laughs> any day <laughs> any day now <laughs> you probably missed this but they they had a horrific day trying to set up this like a system that anyone can dm you from any slack organization if they have your email address Oh, here here we go. This is the Slack wants to be Discord phenomenon. Great. Every, every company just wants to be every other company. Yep. Can Slack be Instagram? Can LinkedIn be YouTube? You I do, don't know. Have you seen, they, they announced this a while ago, that Slack is creating stories. Are you for real? I'm oh being God. serious. It almost looks like an April Fool's joke, but they're working on it. Stories. Slack stories. That's the, I, I mean, that would sound like an April Fool's it joke. really when i saw it i i genuinely checked like is this an old story but no it's a real thing that they are apparently working on oh. but they created this system of like you know oh you'll be able to basically want to be like the the work chat app right so great industries could talk to relay fm people inside of those companies you just got to know the email address that's associated with the slack <sighs> and it was one of those like just typical catastrophe type things where they put this out there and then they just got a ton of pushback because, so say you wanted to contact me and you knew my email address, right? And you would open up in Slack. When you send the invite to me, you could say whatever you wanted in the invite. Oh, so I'm sending you an email. That's what this is, right? It We're would like either <laughs> come to email or into Slack, right? But the problem is you could say right. whatever you wanted to me. Mm. So, like, from a harassment perspective, you can't stop these emails coming, mm -hmm. and you can say whatever you want. Right? It's worse than email. It's, it's worse, worse than email. Than email. Big <laughs> That's, backtrack. That is amazing. Right? <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, uh, now you just can't customize the invite, but you can still send the invite." So they're moving down this path. This is them trying to, I guess, this is more of the push towards getting rid of email. And mm -hmm. It's just like, ah. Uh, that, 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 is, that is an amazing full circle, though, of we won't be email. Oh, it's worse than email. And I just I love all of the companies trying to be all of the new hotness. When can I clubhouse from Google Docs, Mike? That's what I want to know. <laughs> it's probably not that far away. <laughs> Dylan asks, how many iPads do the two of you currently have in rotation and what are their purposes? What's your iPad in lockdown situation? It's all change really mm -hmm. so like i wasn't used i haven't really used one for months mm -hmm. i actually just changed like in the last couple of weeks i think it was after we recorded last you referenced couch ipad mm -hmm. and i thought oh i should do that so like my 11 inch ipad pro now lives on the couch and that's where I read my news. And like if I'm just hanging out on the couch, that's what I use now instead of my phone. 
And I find that to just be much more comfortable. Oh, my God. Yeah, if you're using your phone on the couch, that's awful. No, couch pad, best pad. <laughs> but I've never really thought of it that way because for so long, my iPad has been my work device, right? Mm -hmm. But now I am 100% working on the Mac. This is what lockdown did to me. Mm. It's just been a complete 180. Plus, the new Macs are so good, and I like the new Mac OS. And so I've just basically transitioned completely to working on the Mac again. Mm. So my big iPad Pro has been in the studio in a drawer for the best <laughs> part of a year. Oh, that's so sad. And I actually used it for the first time a couple of days ago because I had to read through some legal documents. And it's, that's what the thing's perfect for, it, using the Apple Pencil and making mm. notes on a document. It's great. Mm. But other than that, I've been using the smaller one at home and I've now been using it more because I've kind of like repurposing it again. Like now that I am pretty much set on the fact that I'm working on the Mac again, that's just where I get my work done now. Mm. Now I can start thinking about what the iPad again is for in my life. It's interesting because it seems like we're on the eve of new iPads and it seems like the best technology could potentially be coming to the bigger one. And I don't know how I feel about that because I don't think I want the big one anymore. Hmm. I just want the little one. And I would just say, like, you know, people have always asked us this. I think that the smaller iPad Pro is the iPad Pro for like 90% of people. Oh, yeah, for sure. And the for big sure. one is only if you are either A, deciding you want to do your work from an iPad, or B, if you're an artist. I think they're really the only two reasons to get the big one. Other than that, the 11 mm -hmm. inch is perfect. So for me personally, I think that's probably where I'm going to be now. And so that means in current use, it's just one iPad. It's my 11-inch iPad Pro. And it's now the couch pad. It's now the couch pad. As you were talking, I was just remembering Steve Jobs brought that couch on stage to mm -hmm. demo the first iPad. Like, that's the, the home of the iPad is, is the couch, you know, right right from, from day one. Yeah, I have my couch iPad. And I love it. It's great. And I've actually been using it a ton for you recommended on our State of the Apps episode. You recommended Reader as a, your RSS reader. Mm -hmm. And it got kind of stuck in my brain. And I've been slowly trying to get back into the world of RSS. And I've been, I've been really loving it. And part of what's great about it is it's just perfect to kind of blast through the internet using that like as the rss reader on an ipad on the couch it's just perfect great for reading i love it i really love that feeling of oh i'm at the end of the internet i don't have to keep going in circles anymore like i know i know that i've covered all of the places that i want to cover and nobody has posted anything new so fantastic that's been one of the big uses of my couch ipad in the pandemic the big victim has been my research ipad which for me has been basically untouched most of this time because like you, I, since I'm not going anywhere, I might as well take advantage of the full desk setup that a Mac provides. But also the research pad was pretty much killed when I started playing around with Obsidian because like if I'm exploring a topic and I'm, you know, I'm reading a bunch of things around a topic, I'm going to constantly want to throw in little notes into my new note system and it's like well you totally have to have a mac to do that so the research pad just languished forever untouched but just as of i don't know like a week ago maybe two weeks ago obsidian is making their ipad version like i, th I think they've really wow ramped up the order that they're intending to do these things because i suspect the number one piece of feedback they got from absolutely everyone was i love this but i wish it was on ios and if you're part of the like vip supporters you can get access to test flight and so i, I put it on my ipad and oh they have it like they actually have a beta app now they have a beta wow. for people to test. It is very beta. Uh, I installed sure. it and synchronized my database and lost 50% of the data. But you know what's great? <laughs> this is... Oh this my is God. No, no, no. But this, but this is the whole... This is the beauty. Like, this is what I love about this system. My whole database is just a bunch of .md files in folders. And before I synced it, I was like, well, this feels like a dangerous operation. Let me just create an archive, you know, zip it all together, like have, oh. have a extra backup great Wait, so it just deleted them I, th I think the problem was a bunch of stuff didn't sync over you know maybe it would have synced over eventually right, but it right, didn't right. on the first run and i also as part of the um the beta testing process 
it clearly didn't like I use emojis in some of my file names so I can just visually distinguish some of the more important files okay. and it threw up an error like emoji files don't exist sync completed no problem though thumbs up you know I was like no it didn't complete no problem <laughs> but anyway they've already released it a couple of versions and and now it seems to be working totally fine and this has single-handedly revived the existence of the research pad in, in my life. Well, it makes sense, just be though. playing around with it. Well, because if the research iPad was great when you were doing your research there, but mm -hmm. then when one of the key research tools became an application that had no iPad version, well... Goodbye, research iPad. <laughs> right? Yeah, like it, yeah, exactly. If you can't get to the data in the way that you want it, well, what are you going to do? So I wasn't surprised. But now I also wouldn't be surprised when the app is in a good state to see the research iPad come back with a plum. Yeah, yeah. And again, just like with reading with Couchpad, it's just a nice, you know, it's it's a nice form factor for, you know, I'm going through a bunch of stuff. I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm just making some notes. Like, I, I really do. I really do love the iPad for that. And, I, you know, I love using it with the pencil. And it's also really nice to, I've always been a big fan of this, have physically separate devices that you can set up to have limits on what they are used for. Like, mm. I, I, I have always loved that. I think it's very conducive to working. And so, yes, I'm very happy to have that device come back more into my life because I've never I've never loved doing all of the research stuff on the Mac. It just it feels like there's there's too many different sorts of things that are occurring here. And I want to be in a different like mental space when I'm doing that sort of work, which is why it's great to be, you know, sitting at a desk, but working on something like you're working on a piece of paper. So. If this question had been asked three weeks ago, I would say that I have one we just used for interneting and reading, but now I think I have two, which is the casual couch pad and the serious work research pad. Thanks to the Obsidian beta for now. Which is like, for me, I don't really feel like the what I'm doing now is my definitive always. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I loved using the iPad for my work is it, I could just take it wherever I needed to be and I travel a lot. Yeah, iPad also really wins with mobility, yeah. which has not been an issue lately. Nope. So I don't really know what the future is going to be for me, but I've been enjoying using the Mac. There's things that I love about the Mac, there's things that I don't love about the Mac, but I do love that it's powerful and everything's right there and everything mm -hmm. is available. But I don't like the messiness of the Mac. Mm. I don't really like windowing, you know? Like it's just <laughs> I can never get things how I want and everything's overlapping and it looks terrible. And like what I like about iOS is there's only so many ways that I can arrange things. Yeah, but that's also the power and of I the I don't Mac. like any of the window snapping tools. Like I don't like them on the Mac. I don't know why. I just don't like it. Because mm. they it just feels alien to me. Which is very strange. Like even though I don't like Windows overlapping, when they don't overlap, it doesn't look like a Mac anymore, and I don't know where I am. It's very strange. <laughs> the messiness of the Mac is also the power of the Mac, and it is still the the one thing that I, that I wish they could get. Like, I just don't, I always feel on my iPad that I I want to be able to easily switch between three things, not just two things, and it always kills me. I'm like, oh god, it's such a pain in the ass to get this other window up on the screen at the same yeah. time. Yeah, it does feel to me like there is a medium between iPadOS and macOS for window yeah. arrangement, and it's not e what either one of them is doing. There's something in the middle, but I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love the iPad to move a little bit more in the Mac direction, but I'm also very aware that that is a supremely dangerous request that mm -hmm. risks all of the things that make the iPad great. We did have a bunch of questions about which notes app you're using now. <laughs> and clearly you've stuck with Obsidian. Yeah, yeah, I'm st I'm sticking with Obsidian. The more I use it, the more I like it. I've, you know, I've ended up now with hundreds and hundreds of notes in there, uh, you know, connected to each other in this nice way that Obsidian does. Still don't understand it, you know. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, <laughs> and I still don't. I still don't understand how it works fully. I don't know. Think think of it like freeform journaling. You know, you, 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 there's not a set structure, and that's part of what the advantage is. You know, mm. I know. I, I I very often come across lots of stuff that I just think this is a fun piece of information, or this could make a a good video at some point, and it's 
nice to be able to throw it in obsidian in a way where there's a tiny bit of structure you know the, the things everything that goes in there now is connected to at least something else that's what i was gonna ask like does every note always have a connection to something else okay i understand yeah at, at this point there's almost nothing that doesn't have a connection you know when you yeah. start and there's fewer notes that, that's different again I, I think most people who use it dramatically overrate the value of the connections and I, and I think people like to show the pictures of the connections because they look pretty i don't really i don't think that that sort of stuff is directly useful but it is nice to in a note be able to just connect it to somewhere else so that in the future you can you know through serendipity happen to find like oh right i had something that was related to this so I, I guess the thing that Obsidian does for me that's perfect is it's not completely structureless, like throwing something into the Notes app where I would just have a ton of random things. And it doesn't have the burden of loading information into Ulysses where I'm going to be writing the actual scripts because I want to keep Ulysses relatively clean and with the smallest number of active projects in it as possible. So it just hits a nice middle ground where I don't feel like there has to be enough to be a sort of proto script or, oh, this one fact is too small to bother with. It just, it handles this in-between state of information really, really well. And I think this is also the case where being an Electron app is the advantage that they could get it on the iPad real fast once they decided to actually do that. It does feel a bit like a weird alien on the iPad. Like, oh, you don't belong here. Okay, it looks like a weird alien everywhere. <laughs> like, it doesn't no, look no. like any user interface I have ever seen on anything. No, th no that's outrageous, Mike. It, no, it, I it don't It does not agree. look like a weird alien on the Mac. It, it does. It's a friendly faceless rock from space to help you with all of your notes i don't understand what your problem is <laughs> i'm not saying it is bad ui what i'm saying is this it's the user interface is not for you it no it just doesn't look like anything else i've well you know what actually it looks closest to like the adobe pro apps i, can, I guess i can kind of see that i can kind of see that and so you know and, and one of the things about adobe's apps is they also don't look like they belong everywhere because they are designed to belong no, everywhere don't. so they don't look like they belong anywhere yeah yeah that's totally fair but uh, yeah, so to answer the other question about my notes, it's Obsidian. Really, really like it. It's still hard to say what the actionable part of Obsidian is, but it's serving me very well, and I'm still playing around with it a lot and figuring it out, and I'm very happy that it's on the iPad. One day in the future when we record an episode in person again, mm -hmm. I really want you to just give me a very basic demo of how this thing looks and works. No, I, I, can't, I, can't, I, can't give you, I can't show you all my secrets. No, Mike. this is why I'm it's saying a basic demo. I don't want to see everything, but surely you can show me like a tree <laughs> of some description, right? <laughs> I just feel like someone needs to explain this to me and every explanation I've come across doesn't help me. Maybe it's just not for me. Maybe my brain. Just can't Here, I, it. I can send you the picture. No, the picture the that everybody, pictures the don't picture help everybody me. loves to see in their notes. <laughs> no, the picture, I can look at pictures on their website and I don't understand it. Yeah, but you haven't seen it in the 80s neon theme, right? So here, oh, I, I, I want to see that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That. I, I thought I you might like that. Okay, theme. so here we go. This, this is the, this is the uh, state of my knowledge. Let me I'll send it to you over Skype. Uh, Skype again. I don't have I don't have I iMessage know, on this computer because Mike, this is the writing computer. The only thing that it's used for is writing and as a server and podcasting <laughs> and live streaming. <laughs> yeah, that's, the writing that's all computer. The, yeah, that's yeah. the only thing that's. Oh, I also uh, it's also my fastest computer, so I use it to do all of the processing and all of the exporting of all of my videos as well. So it does Just that writing. too. Just that's the writing computer. It's all computer. the different types of writing. You know, you write on it, the, the files write to the disk. It's all just writing, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, Gray, I hate it. <laughs> it's just a globe. <laughs> yeah, so th th those are all of my notes and how they're connected to each other. And I don't understand what's complicated about this at all. I like that there's a couple of just like singular dots on the outside. They are the lost notes. Yes, those are the ones that aren't connected to anything. So here's my question for you then. So mm -hmm. the notes that aren't connected to anything or the notes that are just connected to one other note, how do you ever find them? Like, how do you know they're there? Okay, let me pitch it to you this way. Everyone likes to share this picture, but no one who's really getting anything done, I think, is using this picture. It's, it's just fun to look at. Mm -hmm. 
Obsidian is very much like how on your computer, you can just use Spotlight to try to find whatever it is you're looking for. Okay. That's very much what the actual interface is. And so say I come, I'm, I'm reading and I come across an interesting piece of information about like the Royal Albert Hall. Sure. In Obsidian then, I'll just, just like Spotlight, they have a Spotlight-like interface that I can open up and start typing Royal Albert Hall. And if I have a note already with that name, it'll just pull up and I can, oh, I can add this fun fact to the file that existed. And if it doesn't, I can just create the file instantly at that moment and add the fact. Okay. That's how 99% of the time I'm finding stuff is I'm not like looking around for it on this giant sure. mess. I'm actually just using a spotlight type. Search. You're either searching and if it exists, then great. If it doesn't, because I guess the thing that you have to rely on, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but the thing that you have to rely on is that you consistently create notes in a certain way, right? Yeah, you 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 have to name things what they are. Yeah, is, I, is the way I would say it. Th this is why you know I don't know what other people are specifically using it for, but for me, when I'm trying to, you know, in in some ways, my job is to try to collect all of the things that I find are interesting about the world, mm -hmm. and. That's what I'm building up here is like a personal database of everything that I've ever come across that I find interesting enough to make a note of that I might think is useful in the future. But once you've created that Royal Albert Hall note, if you add them and find out something else about the Royal Albert Hall, will you add it to the existing note that already exists or do you create another new note? Yeah, that... I, yeah I would add it to the existing okay. note. Yeah, Because this was one of the things that confused me last time that that's, this mm -hmm. has now helped. Because my understanding was just like every piece of text you ever write gets its own note. Like that was what I took away from that discussion. And that didn't right. make they're, any they're sense to me. They're not separated <laughs> sentences. Yeah, no, that, they're, not, they're not separated That's what sentences. I couldn't get my head around. It's like, this is madness. <laughs> but now, okay. So what I'm kind of seeing is it's not too dissimilar, I guess, from the way that I would make a note. But I think I would have a lot, still a lot less singular notes. But, you know. Yeah. And, and the, the way that the, the link stuff is useful is that there are situations when you're working on something else you can kind of see if you've connected to this thing from somewhere else in the database. Right. Like it'll draw that to your attention, you know, Oh, you know, you're working on this video, which, you know, is related to this thing in London and in the Royal Albert hall note, you made a connection to this other thing here. And so it's just like reminding you that these two ideas are related or, you know, this, this might be a nice time to make an offhanded reference to this other fact that's connected. Does this happen automatically? So say you were writing a note about some street in London and then you just wrote the words Royal Albert hall in there. Mm. Does Obsidian automatically link or alert you? Yeah. So, so even if I don't, manually uh, link those two together later on if i'm working on the royal albert hall note i can see that in other places i've mentioned this okay. and it's like oh okay there are connections here that's one of the things that's nice about the software is trying to draw your attention right to the connections even if you haven't always explicitly in the way the program wants you to made a connection between two notes but things could get out of hand though right like if you had a note called the would it link to every other time the word the has been used in Obsidian? That would be stupid. No, no, no. I, I know it's stupid. I'm making a stupid example, but I'm just trying to understand it. But would it do that? Do the backlinks for the? I don't think it would work that way. Okay. The. Oh, okay. You have 50 notes that start with the word the. So it's only checking for if a note starts with the phrase? That's the ones that it's just pulling up because those are the most likely ones. Oh, okay. Right? So I've just... Okay, so the shift to create. Yes. So, hmm. okay, so I have what they call unlinked mentions. Yep. There are in my database 12,155 unlinked mentions of the word the in the database. And so then what do you do to link those? Please don't. But like, <laughs> what, <laughs> I've, I've what no do you do to like, do you have to do something or do you create a link? From those? So the other thing I like about this is that it's basically markdown with mm -hmm. one additional feature, which is if you put two square brackets around a word, that creates a link. That is you explicitly saying, 
I want to link to the note that has this as the title. So now if you put two square brackets around the word the, there will be 12,000 linked mentions. No, no. It, I would have to go to another note uh-huh. where the word the exists and put square brackets around that word the, and then only that instance will be linked to my note, which is called the. So the, the links are very deliberate. They don't happen automatically. Right. You have to say, I want to want do to link them. This, but this thing. Yeah. the app still does create a dotted line link to everything, but you then have to go in and be like, yeah, I want these to be hierarchically linked together. Yeah. But the application itself will highlight to you, like if you've missed something, like for example, if you go to the Royal Albert Hall one, if you've missed one, you now could link that together if you wanted to. The app is smart enough to tell you that. Yes, there is a place where you can go where the app will suggest if it thinks there's something that isn't connected that you might want to. That's what it will do. This is making a lot more sense to me now. Okay. Are we, are we finally beginning to get there a little bit? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, good. The more I learn about it, the more I realize I do not have a use for this. But that And that's totally fine. I just mm-hmm. was really struggling to understand what it did. But I, I'm feeling like I'm getting it a bit more now. And honestly, yeah. the, the example of the did help me. Because okay, okay. <laughs> that was what I wanted to check is like that the application is cross referencing every single note with every single note. Because I think that's what you, in my mind, that's what you would want it to do because you're relying on this system to pick up pieces of information you've otherwise dropped. Yeah. And that, that has totally happened to me a few times yeah. as the database has gotten bigger where I've realized, oh, I, f- I phrased something in a slightly different way yeah. and I have two things that can be merged or I didn't realize that I've, I've already written something about this. But that feels like the superpower for someone like you. And this this is why I really like it, yeah. If you've been going on a train here and a train over there and then at a certain point they intersect, I mean, we're off to the races, right? Like now you've stumbled across something which could be super interesting in a way that you wouldn't initially think about. So like yeah. as a person who is like collecting pieces of information, eventually you get enough of them to link together. You've got a cool story to tell. Yeah, that, that's the idea of it. Like even if it wasn't serendipitously connecting things in, in this way, it would still be useful just as a database. Mm-hmm. But I, I view that as a like, the more that goes in here, there's a higher chance of this lottery ticket paying off someday with an interesting connection that I didn't think. But it's still valuable to use even without that. And also just for me, the other thing I like to be able to do is connect the related videos to each other. So as any intense viewer of the channel will know, I love making little connections between videos. And this, this is one way where when I'm thinking about stuff, it's helpful to me to be able to mark explicit connections. Like, oh, this video is related to that video at this point. It's not really actionable, but I do find it helpful in some way just to, just to be constantly contextualizing how all of the videos are related to each other. That was helpful. Okay, great. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by FitBod. FitBod is the fitness app that provides a personalized exercise plan, a fitness plan to actually fit you. When it comes to fitness, FitBod believes that everyone can be better. Whether you're working out three days a week or twice a day, FitBod has an algorithm that uses data and analytics to help you build on your previous workout so that your next workout is scientifically proven to be better than your last one. FitBod has been fine-tuned by certified personal trainers to bring the best practices of strength training to you. Your workout program is tailored exactly to suit your needs, making it perfect for your unique body, experience, environment, and goals. Look, it can be hard to know exactly how you should be training, how much exercise you should be doing. You don't want to overwork or underwork, and this is what FitBud helps you out with. It will figure all of that out for you so you don't have to worry, and it's going to mix up your muscle groups and exercises, your sets, reps, and weight over time to help keep you on top form. You don't want to spend hours researching all of this. FitBod does it for you. If you're working out at home, they have a bunch of great bodyweight workouts for you. But if you have access to gym equipment, they have tons of great options there as well. Basically, everything's covered. FitBod is there to help you with the exercise routine that you want, the exercise routine you need, no matter how much equipment you have access to. I really love just how easy the FitBot app is to use. I really love the little videos that they give you for each exercise, and I feel like everything's explained really well. I like that they show me this is what you're going to be doing, this is what it's going to be doing for you, and I really like that they have an Apple Watch app so I can very easily advance from exercise to exercise while I'm actually getting it done. 
FitBod is available on iOS and Android, and you can get started right now by going to fitbod.me slash Cortex, and you'll also get 25% off your membership. That's fitbod.me slash Cortex to try out FitBod for free and get 25% off your FitBod membership. Our thanks to FitBod for their support of this show and Relay FM. Jordi asks, I'm wondering why you're so secretive about the exact number of theme system journals that you order or sell each time. Mm. You've mentioned a number in the past, and I appreciate that, but now it's cloaked in mystery again. Oh, it is cloaked in mystery. Why is that, Mike? That fra- Honestly, the phrase cloaked in mystery makes me want to keep it a secret more. <laughs> <laughs> so this is interesting. How many journals are under this cloak? No idea. Could be one. Could be a million. Depends how big the cloak is. Depends on how big the cloak is. It's a good. This is look. This is a good question because, like, thinking back across it when I saw this question, I was like, oh yeah, this is weird because there mm-hmm. have been times where we've been very explicit about the number and times where we haven't. And I'll be honest, there is no real rhyme or reason why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about how many we ordered the first time, the very very first time, which was two hundred, mm-hmm. because if we didn't sell out, I didn't want to look like an idiot. Right, it would just be embarrassing. It'd be so embarrassing. <laughs> and then there was a little bit of that for the second time, where I think we ordered like two thousand of them or something, and it was still that was still a hangover there. And then the first time we ever shared the numbers when we made a bet on it was when we ordered three thousand, which was the that's next right, one. that's right. So that was the point when we actually shared a concrete number. So it's it's always been a bit up or down, and I've never really felt one way or another about it. So like I'm happy to share some numbers, like now Mm -hmm. so uh, should we talk about how many we sold of version two yeah so version two is what we've sold this year so all of these sales have been basically this year i guess starting in late november so version two we've now sold as of recording now 7300 journals Mm -hmm. that's a version two which has now eclipsed version one so we've sold more version two journals in the last three months than we sold of all of the version one journals which was 18 months. Right. And that was just under 7,000 was how many we sold at the first one. Mm-hmm. It was like 6,900 and something. So those are the numbers. Mm-hmm. People really like the second version. <laughs> <laughs> As they should. It's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's going really well. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is one of these things that we, we just sort of like slipped into not talking about the numbers. And the question's a good time to decloak the mystery of how many there actually are and they're just big numbers that are also a little intimidating when placing orders and hoping to god they're not getting wet on a dock somewhere as they're delayed in customs or whatever and you're trying to visualize like how big is a box of several thousand journals it's probably pretty big Mm -hmm. and we've ordered ten thousand. right that's that's also the the terrifying part Mm -hmm. is there's there's 10,000 on the way, mm-hmm. which we're hoping will basically last us the year. That's roughly what we're thinking will be, will be the case. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll have to see exactly how that goes, but that's the next big order that's coming in to try to have it so that people can always buy a journal and have it shipped to them, just like the way inventory management is supposed to work. I think we've solved it. I think we solved the stock problem now. You're confident in that? Yeah. Okay. I believe in you, Mike. I, I am genuinely. Because now, like, I know how long it takes to make more. Mm-hmm. And for me, I think the only time that we're ever going to be a, a risky point again will be December, January. Yes. Right? Because that's going to be the the onboarding point for more people. <laughs> And so, you know, like I'm going to spend a lot of time now over the next nine months trying to forecast how on earth, how many shall I actually order at Mm -hmm. that point? I I have no idea right now, but it will be a lot because, again, like we are now in a point where we can make these bigger bets because the product is fixed Mm -hmm. or it wasn't before. So one of the reasons that we had a lot of struggle with version one and couldn't make an order of the sizes that we've been making is because we didn't want to keep stock for a long time because we wanted to change it. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to have so much stock that it would take us two years to sell it when in six months' time we wanted a new version, you know? Mm -hmm. So now that we don't have that, like, it doesn't matter. If we still have 6,000 of these in January of next year, it doesn't matter because they'll just get sold then too. 
you know? Right. Yeah. We're not competing with uh, the new versions of our own thing anymore, which exactly. does dramatically simplify the problem. So that's been a big help. And uh, now I don't feel the threat of embarrassment anymore, right? Because <laughs> I, I feel pretty confident in what we've got. So those are mm-hmm. the numbers that we have. Oh, actually, a bit of follow-up. Uh, you know, we were talking about the UK VAT stuff. Oh, right, yeah. Well, well, we still don't have a VAT number. That's not the follow-up. Oh, okay. But I ordered a journal when it arrived, no problem. Oh, great. Fantastic. I can't say that that's going to happen to you if you order one, but it, I, right. <laughs> it did arrive, so great. <laughs> so yours wasn't stuck on that ship in the Suez Canal. It made it, made it through just fine. Uh, that I had some people reach out to me to ask if we would be affected by this. <laughs> And as far as I'm aware, no. I mean, obviously the journals are made in Europe now and the paper comes from Europe, but gosh knows, right? There might be like yeah, some you never know, component right? somewhere, like <laughs> some ink or something. But as yeah. far as I'm aware, we are unaffected by the Suez Canal. Yeah, the, the company needed one new debossing stamp and it was it was in the Suez Canal. <laughs> like, but no. I will tell you, I, I really felt it when I saw that. Because like, I now know what that feels like. <laughs> And I actually uh, have a friend mm-hmm. who has products on that boat. Oh, God. That's right? brutal. On that exact ship, the Evergreen. That's awful. I know someone who has container ships with products on that. I mean, if you see a picture of it, it's enormous. Like the, I mean, it's the size of a city. Yeah, those, those, those container ships, the size of them, it just blows your mind, mm-hmm. it, even in just a photograph, and you start... You start looking at like, okay, how many how many containers can I count on the deck of that ship? And then you remember, oh, right, there's entire companies that convert those containers into micro apartments for people. Like, they're very big. <laughs> but I am hoping that it gets resolved soon before we have to ship anything by air again. Oh, Because right. I guarantee you that all shipping rates are up for everything right now. Yes. I, I was like, why? But, but Mike, if we're using airplanes, the airplanes don't get stuck in the Suez Canal. Well, they might. I don't know what's on the boats, <laughs> but <laughs> but now all shipping, all freight shipping is going to be more expensive. I don't know. That, 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 that ship stuck in the Suez Canal. I haven't been able, like, I've been dying to really dig into all of the details of it since I was only just able to see the headlines and I was in my real crunch, gotta finish a video period. But it's just, I don't know. There's There's something like delightfully chaotic about the whole situation like it's mm-hmm. it's bad that a ship is stuck in the suez canal but it's also kind of funny because it looks ridiculous oh i mean you've seen the memes with like the the one little digger trying to get the right <laughs> no i haven't seen <laughs> oh there's just the one little digger trying to get the like trying to wear away some of the side like the wall of like the bank <laughs> and it's like this, this tiny stuff. little digger in this astronomically large container ship like as if it's somehow uh, gonna help i've got i've got a lot of, of fun internet catching up to do oh, around it's, that it's I been can't good wait. It, this has been one of those rare things which just unites people into to making fun of something. It's just so incomprehensible. No, I disagree. It's the exact opposite. Okay. It's it's funny because it's really understandable. The problem is very basic. Coming at this from different places. I agree with what you're saying. You know, you know what the problem is? There, there's a ship. It's too big. It's stuck. Right? Like... Am I just a weirdo here? There's something kind of delightful about it. It's like, oh. No, it's very relatable. Somebody just made a little screw up. But what I mean is like the sizes and scale of things are just oh, too yeah, much for us yeah. to comprehend. But the idea that somebody made like just uh, did a whoopsie and now, <laughs> and now <laughs> like the entire globe's shipping has stopped. Again, another reason it's relatable is, oh, Great. We're stuck in line behind the person at the grocery store who, you know, wants to take a long time or is trouble for some reason, right? It's like, it's the ship version of that. Like, yeah. oh, great. Except the problem is the entire world's supply chain is trying to pass through this one narrow canal. <laughs> I don't want to place a bet on how long it's going to take to get that ship fixed. I feel like I have I have no ability to bet. Is it before the podcast goes out or is it a month from now? I, like, I, I mean, have no I saw idea. something that suggested they were going to have it out this weekend, but I don't believe it for a second. You don't be believe honest. it for a second? No, <laughs> I just feel like <laughs> this is not something anybody can estimate. Mm-hmm. It will happen when it happens. <laughs> it's the one <laughs> I look at it as like, th- this will just happen when it happens. And that's that. Right. Enjoy going around the Cape of Good Hope, everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, have fun with that. Alex says, what is something you wished you would have known earlier when designing your works up? Oh, I, f- I feel like this is, this is a you question, but I have, I have one little one. My little one is you need 
a charging station. So even if you don't think you have a lot of things that need charging, you have more than you think you do. And it's a real pain in the butt mm. to just try to have some random wires in random locations to charge your things. So it, it took a while, but I think halfway through this whole situation at some point, I have a little, it's just right behind me, but I have a little like multi-level open tiny storage space thing that I got a 10 USB hub for and just like bought a bunch of wires and, and went around my office and thought, what's everything that needs charging? Great. You're all going to live on one of the shelves of this thing and you're going to be plugged in all the time. And this is where all of the things charge. And I'm... Um, made a ridiculously big improvement to the the tidiness and the readiness of my whole office and i just kept thinking i don't need a charging station but i really did and i think everyone should just pick a shelf put a bunch of usb cables on that shelf and that's where all the things charge mm. what about you i wish i would have known there would be a global pandemic for to shut my studio <laughs> down for over six months <laughs> Okay. Next I mean, question. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that's the spirit of the question. That's being. It's asked. also not very relatable. No. Because I mean, let's hope. <laughs> this isn't something you need to think about. Oh, my office people got in touch again. By the way. Oh, which they did. I, did I, they? I thought was funny. Yeah, I got. I deals, got another deals, email. Deals. <laughs> like you, you got in touch with us, looking for some office space. We're ready to accept customers. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you need, and then just. Dragged it into the trash and didn't reply. <laughs> I'm into year two of my lease now. Wow. That's much longer than I would have guessed. It's very upsetting. What percentage of, of that time have you actually been able to be in the office? Less than half. Less than half. Mm -hmm. The real advice that I'll give, and this is good for any environment, is know that in six months you will want to redo it. So yes. start paying yes. attention immediately from when you're working of the things that you would wish would be better and just keep a mm -hmm. note of them all. So then when you get to the point after six months where you hate your office, you already have a list of things to improve it. Yeah, that's totally perfect. And I think that that's bang on for me. I think whatever it was, seven months, maybe eight months into this, I, I rearranged the desks and, and also changed all of the storage. You're totally right, Mike. That's a great one. When you think you're done... Start making notes on all of the things that annoy you and in six months, change it. You know, I barely started. Like, I've genuinely barely started to get this studio to a point where I'm happy with. Like, I never actually got to do it. Well, I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> I will be when I begin. <laughs> <sighs> I'm so sorry, Mike. Uh, it's just, you know, what are you going to do? Look, it's brighter days are coming up, mm -hmm. coming up fast. Mm -hmm. So... You're going to get all the mega office you want. This episode is brought to you by Hover, one of this show's longest running sponsors. Because when you have that one big idea, where do you go? Your business starts with a domain name. For so many entrepreneurs, Hover is that first big step. It's that big leap. I use Hover all the time to create websites that are actually important and also i buy a bunch of domains to root around look some of them are jokes everybody knows i have so many variations of getmoretax.com and they are all registered at hover what i love about it is i can go in really easily search for that domain and then when i find the one that i want or i find the one that's available i register it in just a few seconds and then i can just set up a forward i go from domain search to having the forward set to where i want it to go in minutes because hover is so easy easy to use and they have over 300 domain name extensions that you can choose from so no matter what you want to build there is a domain name waiting for it and they have the best technical support so if you have any questions they're there to help you and hover as a whole is dedicated to getting you online and not upselling you so they give you free who is privacy so bad guys don't get your info they have a really great and easy to understand user interface and they're also doing great sales on popular top level domains every single month it's so easy to see why hover is the popular choice for people starting businesses and it is the domain registrar that i've been using for probably 10 years at this point if not more i have so many domains registered with hover it's where i go when i have that next idea buy your domain and start using it today go to hover.com slash cortex and you'll get a 10 percent discount on all new purchases that's hover.com slash cortex make a name for yourself with hover a thanks to hover for their support of this show Theodore asks, great name, Theodore, actually. Yeah, you like Theodore? Yeah, Theodore's a good name. Anyway, Theodore asks, how would you describe yourselves when you were in school? 
How did you manage your tasks then? And how do your systems today differ from the ones that you had at the time? What was school age Mike like? I feel like I don't have any idea what you were, what you were like as a young lad working your way through your GCSEs. I wonder if it would be surprising, actually, if I describe... I kind of had a couple of different stages of school, mm-hmm. Mike. I guess the first stage was kind of just like really followed all the rules and tried to get all my work done to the best of my ability. Mm-hmm. Then I did the exact opposite. <laughs> so was like, stage one is foreshadowing what stage two must be. <laughs> yeah, like stage one version of me was just like teacher's pet kind mm-hmm. of. And then stage two was just acting out mm-hmm. like i like i look back on myself then and i'm just like why were you the way that you were like one of my <laughs> things was like i wrote all of my english course work in a pen that had purple ink just to be annoying just, just to be annoying which is unacceptable so when my work was done i had to photocopy it or to hand it in mm-hmm. so it would be in black and i knew that i was going to have to do this but just like kept doing it i just kept turning the work in it wasn't me that was photocopying it my teacher would photocopy it mm. you know and this is like when i would be put into a situation where i was having to stay after school to do my english course work because i just wouldn't do it without being put in a room to do it right and it was one of those situations where i was probably i knew this like i know looking back i i understand it i probably knew it at the time where i was good at in school right like i was smart and I had good grades. They could have been better if I would have actually applied myself properly. But I went to a school that kind of needed good grades. So the teachers would have to put up with my shit. Right. Okay. I see. I see. Which, like, when I look back on it now, it, I, like, it annoys me that I was that way. But it's just how I was, right? So, like, it was like, oh, you're going to be in coursework class. No, you're putting me in detention. <laughs> but we're not going to call it that. No, coursework class, Mike. It's not detention. And you're going to take the work that I put in pink ink because you need that and you're just going to photocopy it. So that was up until the ages of like 16. Mm-hmm. 16 to 18 when I was in A-levels, I just changed again and just really wanted to do the best that I could do. Mm-hmm. So like it really, my problem was in the ages of 15 to 16, I made a lot of friends quickly because like the way that I don't really know how this sort of stuff works in America, but when you go into GCSEs, you choose your subjects. And so the classes get mixed up. And so I was exposed to a lot of people and then started to make more friends. And then the making of more friends kind of made me start to act out a bit. Oh, okay. Your friends were a bad influence on you. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. But like, what is that? Like, is there, what is GCSE? How would Americans understand this, what GCSE yeah, level no, is? Yeah, no, don't, don't, don't try it. It, do, it doesn't no. matter. Look, the bit, like right. Mike, Mike was able to do something a little bit more intense than electives where he was able to have control over his schedule at, for what classes he was taking. And he there took, you go. You, you've just did it. You, he you, took you classes helped. that ended up with him with a bunch of troublemakers who also yep. picked those electives. Correct. Because humans dramatically underestimate how powerful selection effects are and this is one of those cases which kids pick what classes it's not a random selection uh it tells you something about the kids <laughs> that's what that is but then when i did my a levels which is 16 to 18 mm-hmm. i was much more well i think part of the reason for me then was i actually got to choose the things i wanted to do mm-hmm. so i was just more engaged because i got to choose the subjects i cared about the most because the places where I tended to act out the most was the stuff that I didn't care about. Yeah, I've, I've always thought the whole A-level system is the best part of the UK educational system. That, mm-hmm. at, that at 16, you get to both choose and have complete control over the schedule and also dramatically reduce the number of classes that are being taken. Like, I, I think those two are a great combination. And then a very normal thing people to do is the second year to change it again. You, like, drop one. Mm-hmm. Like, I did four and then dropped one for my second year. That reduces a lot of student unhappiness. Like, Mm -hmm. you can pick the things that you like, and you can also drop all of the annoying surrounding parts that, you know, are what make it feel like you're going to school. And and instead, you get to experience a kind of mini college. Like, I think that the A-level system has a lot to recommend it, you know, broadly speaking, in the way that it works. I did make one fatal flaw of my A-levels, though. Yeah? They tricked me. 
right? Oh, yeah? They're like, what, how do they trick you? You should do politics. There's no coursework. It's just exams. Oh, that, sound, that sounds great. Right? And it's like, oh, wait, so much worse. There were so many exams for politics <laughs> that you basically just ended up doing the coursework in a timed environment. It was terrible. Plus, I didn't really enjoy <laughs> politics that much. Did get a couple of cool school trips, though. Mm-hmm. So wasn't all bad right so no coursework 10 times as many tests they, they did but they just didn't mention that second part no <laughs> so it's only exams but not that like <laughs> it's three times more exams than any other course that you're doing where you just write essay, the exams are just essays so it's just like i hate this this is terrible i'm now writing my course work under a timed environment but maybe i'd actually prepared for that in gcse mm. By mm-hmm. not actually spending the time to do the coursework right. and doing it all against the timer anyway, because I was going to run out of time before I had needed to had it in. So <laughs> anyway, so I had some some trouble years, but overall, mm-hmm. I, I did try to do my best. Mm-hmm. That's very noble of you attempting to do your best. I unfortunately was a terrible slacker who never <laughs> attempted to do his best <laughs> at school. <laughs> oh, I was still slacking. Yeah. Like, I, I would only do my best up to the level at which I was willing to, to commit, but within those parameters. <laughs> right, yeah. No, I, I was, I was uh, shall we say, not strongly motivated to do mm-hmm. anything in school. And, and yeah, I was as an extremely strategic slacker. And it's one of those things in life where it just... It, it feels like everything comes around, it all comes full circle, and it's, it's why when I was a teacher, I was 10 times worse of a strategic slacker than I ever was when I was a student, but it's like, oh, right, the, you know, the kid who slacked off as a student is also a slacker teacher. Like, what a, what a shocking surprise. Like, he's only, only wants to know exactly what really matters, you know? And, I, I, like, in high school, I was always this pain-in-the-ass kid doing these calculations for exactly how much is this assignment worth? and try to constantly predict out what my grade could be wow. and be like you know b b is an excellent target to aim for and like higher than a b is more work than it's worth lower than a b is no good so like don't don't spend one iota more energy than you absolutely need to get that b like b plus is great but it's a you know it's a sign that you may be pushing too hard and so like that was that was very much my take on it in school and i feel lucky that it didn't bite me in the ass in some ways like you know being a strategic slacker is it's a risky move like you know you better not get anything wrong because if you do problems can compound really quickly and i i just sort of i lucked out with that stuff but i did not enjoy being a student at all i thought basically everything that the teachers were asking me to do was pointless busy work and adult me felt vindicated that child me was correct in this matter that like yes 90 percent of it was total pointless busy work all of this is to say it is not surprising that i had absolutely terrible work habits when i left the education system and you know stumbled around as a young adult for a while trying to figure out oh how do i actually get things done that i care about when there isn't like this whole system and structure around me so that's what i was like so i think it's fair to say if you were listening to this show and you're in school you were doing a better job than both of us were because you are the type of person that cares about having your life in some kind of order <laughs> right i mean i mean yes but i also know that younger me would listen to this podcast because mm-hmm. he would know that the older me was the way that he is like i i remember being a kid and like you know because back in then there were no podcasts but you know you just hear people talking you know there's interview shows or whatever and i just remember like always feeling like i was listening really hard for yeah but how how is this successful adult really and and i always felt like my ears perked up a lot when i i heard people say like just casual remarks about being a slacker in certain situations so Mm. i don't recommend this as a general path but you know you can't change the nature of the way that you are to some extent you've just got to like 
you got to work with what you've got. And it's also, again, why, like I said, I like the A-level system because it sooner gives students more control so that they can select things that they're actually interested in and then be like, oh, now I have a reason to try to be effective in what it is that I'm doing as opposed to feeling like I'm in a prison system and I'm just trying to shirk the pointless work that they're foisting upon me. Devon asks, how do you guys get back on track when your day's plans go horribly wrong? <laughs> I like this horribly wrong. I like the assumption that if something goes horribly wrong, I have the ability to get my day back on track. <laughs> That's what uh, I okay. enjoy most here, is that there is the assumption that that is what happens to me. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is when the day's gone horribly wrong, the answer is just bail just bail on the day well, if my day goes horribly wrong the first thing that i will do in the attempt of trying to bring any order in it is taking a real serious look at my to-do list and realizing how much of it can be delegated to like can be moved to different days mm -hmm. like okay. that is the first thing that i would do is like taking a very real look at it and being like no no not what would you prefer was done today like what can you actually realistically right. do today everything else is moving Right, right. Not not your fantasy day. Mm -hmm. Like let's let's get let's get real about yep. what could happen in the remaining three hours of productivity that you have left or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that's a good idea. I mean, obviously, horribly wrong is a lot of things. Uh, you know, I, I I do think it is a real skill to be able to know when a day is lost and just accept that. That is better than feeling bad for the rest of the day. But mm -hmm. it, can, it can be hard to know when to make that judgment call. A thing that, that I've done over the past few months, which has been very helpful, is you know, my problem is always getting started in the morning. So uh, you know, while I am very protective of my mornings, if a day goes wrong, it's because I'm having a hard time like just getting going with what needs to be done. And I have calendared out what my theoretical morning should be and you can very easily get into the situation of like oh i've dilly dallied for an hour and now you know i've already like pushed all of these things back and, and you just like get this cascade problem so i actually have a little thing in omnifocus which is the dumbest thing but it's the first item that pops up after i've brushed my teeth and, and done all the normal boot up stuff is it says like if it's a late start, start at the beginning and go until exercise. So I have a kind of blocked off what should be the beginning of the morning, which is like two work sessions and an exercise session. And that's, you know, maybe a third of what the theoretical morning should be. But I've actually genuinely found this dumb reminder to myself that, hey, man, yeah, you've got a late start today. You know, you slept in or you just couldn't get going or whatever. Cool. But right now you can just start at the beginning and go for like three of these double units and still have a victorious day, even if this is all that you accomplish. And as is often the case, when you set a kind of lower bar for yourself, it can be one easier to start and you can end up doing much more than you originally planned to anyway so it is the dumbest psychological trick but it's basically this way of telling myself you can start at the beginning anytime you're not actually late for this imaginary writing appointment that you've put on the calendar you can just start right now so that's one of the things that i do what's a double unit you said double unit. What is oh, that? sorry. All of my time is broken down into units, which are 40 minutes. That's like the writing blocks is how I think of that as like, okay, two double units of writing in the morning is like a session of 120 minutes, a quick break, and then another session of 120 minutes, and then exercise. Like that would be the ideal start to a morning. This idea of blocking out your ideal day kind of, it this feels like there's some parallels to me and my morning alarms. <laughs> I'm never actually going to wake up at 8.30, but I like to believe I will. I'll, I'll disagree because I do hit the mornings more often than not. And it sounds like hey, I always you wake are up. planning to fail I always wake with up. the first alarm. <laughs> to be fair, I've sort of talked about this before. Like 
planning out a theoretically perfect two weeks. Again, it's not like I'm creating a schedule that I'm really holding myself to. I always think this is much more useful as a limiting exercise in, in terms of thinking, even if you had the perfect two weeks, how much can you really get done if you actually put it all on the calendar? And I think that helps constrain being over ambitious in goals and trying to be much more realistic. I could imagine it helps you be realistic about anything additional you could put into a week too, right? Like if someone wants to have a meeting with you. Yes. You're like, well, I know I can't do it on these two days because even if I was just doing the bare minimum of these two days, I wouldn't have the time for it. Yeah, yeah. It's less about interruptions. I mean, especially in the past year, because I haven't had any, which is delightful for the most part. And it is more just about knowing like, oh, I only have so many hours of writing in a day and only so many hours of writing in a week. And by putting that down on the calendar, it can help constrain. Yeah, yeah. There's many interesting projects you would like to work on. But you can't spread these hours over too many things, or you can't always chase down the most exciting thing at this particular moment. Otherwise, you'll never get finished. Mm. Again, like that is always something that I am struggling against, but this is one of the tools that is helpful. You know, like I have it in Fantastic Al open a lot, is the theoretically perfect schedule, but I'm not really trying to match that down to the minute it's it's again just more of like a guidance is it a separate calendar yeah yeah it's it's the way in fantastic how you can bring up those calendar sets which is one of the reasons why i love it that's cool so you could turn it off if you're like i need to be realistic about what i'm actually supposed to be doing today yes yeah i have it open to just sort of look at sometimes and to think about you know what's going to happen this week but yeah it's it's not an actionable calendar you know like when we're planning when the next cortex recording is going to be or if i have to set up a meeting or whatever like that calendar goes right away it's like goodbye and then i have a, a separate actionable calendar no, i'm sorry we can't record this week i have seven theoretical writing blocks <laughs> that i'm not gonna do yeah exactly <laughs> i think that, that i i do bring have some element at this type of thing when it comes to my task list mm -hmm. where like i have things in my task list where it's like in an ideal world they would be done today but they don't have to be so it's not exactly the same but there is this element of like i kind of know when looking at my list like what are the things that actually need to be done today and what are the things that i could move if i needed to mm -hmm. i couldn't really work with calendars that way like for me Calendars are very much a source of truth. Yes. A lot of my work really is based on time, right? Because I'm collaborating mm -hmm. with people in real time, which means we both have to be where we're supposed to be at the time we said we're going to be there. So mm -hmm. I can't really have this like, maybe I'll <laughs> show up. Maybe right. I won't, right? Like I, <laughs> it does, my life doesn't really work that way. Um, but we've really, it's kind of funny because now this question has gone horribly wrong because we're not actually talking about the question anymore. So how do you get your day back on track when it goes horribly wrong? I really think that one of these things is you just got to, you got to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. right, like I had one of these days recently when I lost an entire day trying to get our notebooks through customs. Mm -hmm. I just lost the entire day because I was asked to produce paperwork that I couldn't even conceive of. And so we had to spend the entire day researching what on earth I was being asked to produce. And the real great thing that can happen on a day like this is that you fix the problem, right? Because if you fix the thing that has made your day go horribly wrong, then you can give yourself a pat on the back and you don't worry about all the things you didn't do. Because it's like, man, I got through that one. But this isn't always the case. And sometimes things can go on for longer. Sometimes you just have to be like, well, there was nothing I could have done about this. Mm -hmm. If it's gone that bad, like I don't even think you can get that one problem fixed that you want for the day or the one most important thing you want to do for the day you kind of just have to let it go not an easy one no it's 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 not easy at all and yeah I, I completely agree with you that's what i mean by it's difficult to recognize the situation sometimes and just say okay this one got lost but it's way better to do that than beat yourself up over it for the rest of the day